Do you remember how I mentioned Don Jose Reventos in last week's episode of the Wine CEO podcast? Well, he was a Spaniard who traveled to the Champagne region, fell in love with the sparkling wines made here, and came back to Spain to make the first ever sparkling Spanish wine in the traditional Champagne method. Hi friends, my name is Sarah and I'm a certified sommelier and host of the Wine CEO podcast. And this week on the show, I'm continuing the conversation around sparkling wines being made in Spain and a specific focus on the Panetes region. And I'm interviewing the great, great grandson of Don Jose Reventos. I was so excited to sit down with Pepe and learn more about the Reventos y Blanc family winery. Pepe is the 20 first generation winemaker at his family's winery, 21 generations. Can you believe that? This is one of the oldest wineries in the world. And Pepe has been committed to making incredible sparkling wines and still wines like his ancestors many generations before him. He joined his family's winery in 2001, and he is also a huge advocate for the natural winemaking industry, as well as sustainable practices throughout the Panetti's region. Now, in 2012, Pepe left the Cava Dio feeling that the regulations were not strict enough to make the best quality sparkling wine. And if you remember from last week's episode, I spoke about Corponat and Classic Panetti's, which in the last 10 years have emerged as kind of the next step up for making Cava in the Panetti's region. But Pepe didn't feel that either of these were strict enough either. So he is truly paving his own way and setting some new standards for the sparkling wine production in the Panetti's region. Pepe also spent a lot of time advocating for the Zarello grape talking about why this is such an amazing grape variety for making sparkling wine, and not just in Northern Spain, but also throughout Europe and the rest of the world. He talks about Panetes and why this region is so beautiful and absolutely perfect for making sparkling wine. He spoke about some other interesting grape varieties that you may not be as familiar with and some fun things that will be coming out of the Panetes region in the near future. So lots to look forward to. It's a really fun episode and one that I think you'll enjoy. If you stick around long enough, you'll also get to our tasting notes at the end where we looked at one of his sparkling wines and one of his still wines and Pepe critiques my sparkling wine skills, which I will be honest are not as good as my red wine tasting skills, but we had a lot of fun tasting his wines and talking about those as well. So this is an episode you don't want to miss. So grab your favorite glass of sparkling wine, hopefully one from Panetti's in Northern Spain. And let's dive into my conversation with Pepe Reventos. Well, Pepe Reventos, welcome so much to the Wine CEO podcast. I'm so happy to have you with us today. How are you doing? I am doing excellent. Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm so excited to chat with you today and have our listeners learn a little bit more about your incredibly historic winery. Would you mind first telling us a little bit about how you got into the winemaking industry? Um, I got into winemaking by necessity because my father was having a very hard time in the, in the 90s. And uh, um, uh, finally, we could convince him the, to accept uh, some support. And uh, although I am not very smart, I tried very hard because when you see your father not having a good time, you try very hard. That's awesome. So Reventos E. Blanc Winery is a family-owned winery. Um, can you tell us about the history? Because this is one of the oldest wineries in Spain, right? Many, many generations. It's one of the oldest wineries in the world because we have to uh, remind ourselves that the uh, wine um, historically is a Mediterranean uh, um, beverage, is a Mediterranean uh, culture, is a Mediterranean gastronomy, is a Mediterranean uh, heart and soul. Eh? And uh, it's something I like to uh, remind a lot because sometimes, because we're very bad at marketing, uh, you know, we get a little hidden behind the scenes, but uh, I am a strong... Uh, uh, believer in the power of, of Mediterranean and even in this like dry weather that we're going through, uh, how important it is to understand where, where we make the wines. But yeah, we have documents at home since the 1400s that uh, we've been farming the same uh, property. I happen to represent a 21st generation in the same, uh, in the same farm. Um, this uh, part of the world became famous, this little uh, piece of land became famous in 1870 when my great-great-grandfather made the first Spanish champagne with the grape Charello, which, believe it or not, is at the very top of the white grape pyramids, although the Cava disaster has made that uh, people don't understand the high, immense potential that Charello has. 
well, 21 generations. That is incredible. I mean, I definitely agree. Probably uh, one of the oldest wineries in the world and what a great legacy to be a part of. You mentioned the um, Cava challenges. Would you mind explaining a little bit more about that for some of our listeners, maybe here in the U.S. who aren't as familiar with the challenges that your region has gone through with Cava production? Can you kind of give a quick summary? Yes, yes. It, it's it, it, very simply. Um, there's a big producer called Freshnet that started to um, um, make millions of bottles of the cheapest manufacturing possible uh, sparkling wine. And of course, because it was very cheap, it grew a lot, but could not pay the fair price of the grape to the farmers. And this has destroyed uh, um, the wealth of the communities, uh, the stability of the region, and I would say has uh, also um, move away the prestige of the area and the way of understanding Penedes into quality, where I am probably mistaken, this is only my view, but I think it's the way that Penedes has to follow to survive uh, for many more generations. And I think there was concern for a while that many um, winemakers were making cava in large production, but the quality wasn't quite as great. There wasn't the same oversight. And I think that's why a few of the makers in Panetti started Corpinat, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, last 10 years, there has been a revolution because um, uh, I have to humbly say that I was living in America for five years and you taught me to think big and uh, act small and also um, don't hate the players, change the game. So when I came back from America, we decided to declassify from Cava and uh, create um, the first steps of a dream of a new appellation, um, Burgundy or Barolo, uh, which is younger create, creation, but very successful and terroir driven, inspired. And a few years later, there was classic Penedès created, which is the cremant of Penedès, which is certainly a higher standards than Cava. And then in 2018, there was a group of farmers that created Corpinat Association with an increased level of um, requisites to uh, elevate uh, the territory. We haven't joined any of these other two because we think they are better, but not good enough. We dream on really having an official recognition with the Catalan government, a pyramidal classification of the quality of the vineyards, and really putting the um, protagonists to the valleys, to the villages, and to the crews of Charellos and Sumois of our territory. That's awesome. And both of those villages are within Penedes, though? Yeah, um, I think the heart for sparkling wine is not just the exact Penedes uh, delimitation, but it's certainly inside the big Penedes winemaking region. Okay. And so I know one of the things that you're so um, advocating for is the um, desire for sustainability and um, really understanding where wine comes from. So how do you as a winemaker work to protect this aspect in winemaking to make sure that's really coming through in the wine you're making? Yeah, I think uh, we have to be very careful with the word sustainability, with the word uh, uh, climate change, which are definitely uh, challenges much more important than the wine that we are going through in our nowadays uh, world. Um, because there is a little bit of misleading, no? Uh, we like big words like regenerative, biodynamics, uh, sustainability. And I think wine um, essentially is much more simple than all this. Um, for us, what has been very peaceful is to learn that recuperating the ancient farm of um, the ancient Raventos y Blanc farm that has been uh, here much before me and my father and my grandfather and, you know, like and people that is not the family also, the family sometimes can be also a little bit close minded, not just a family. No? And uh, um, so meaning that it's the place, no? it's, it's about the place. And uh, and, uh, you know, Catalan, mm, Catalan farmhouses, Penedes farmhouses have always been like this. This idea of man, um, uh, human, should I say, with a plant and animal living together in a closed system, you know? in a system that is agriculturally based, that is also um, uh, domestic animal based, that is a survival mode, uh, but also very enriching, you no? Know? 
very enriching because um, in nature, everything tends to balance. And when you work this way, you learn, you know, what the great grandparents were doing. And you, you learn a lot of things about detail, about respect, about um, diversity, which at the end of the day is richness, is resistant, is plants that are plants that really, um, I think, mean, give us fruits that are very um, expression of, of, of where they come from. Eh? So I would say with this, uh, this, this idea that is also a little bit abusive, but minimal intervention, meaning it's, it's about the nature, um, not, not about us uh, humans who make uh, the most important work in, in, in making a wine that speaks from a place. No? So really we're talking about like inspiring masters that I had when I learned to make wines in, 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 in Loire or in Burgundy or, or you know, like in, in Bordeaux, like really got this terroir notion very much in, inside us. Definitely. I know you've described your winemaking as biosynergy. Is that what you're referring to when you kind of use that word? Yeah, well, I was young and, and even more stupid than now. This is one of these big words that I don't I don't like to use anymore. But the idea of to is to work, you understand and, and, and much better, no? Is to work in synergy with with the nature and with biology, you know. But the thing is that I came up with this word because biodynamic, I was like so fed up because like everyone's like, oh my one is very good because I am a biodynamic. And you know, okay, like I learned a lot from biodynamics. We are Demeter certified, but you know, all this thing about requisite certification and stamps and it's, it's a little bit over uh, I think it's too much no okay I love it that's a great description mm -hmm. so um can you tell us a little bit more about the region so Panetics what's so special about this region why do you think it is um, perfectly positioned to make the kind of wine you're making well it's not me that I think is that uh, already in 1870 Raventos Fajo made the most mineral sparkling wine in 1870 uh, with the grape Charello. Eh? So it's not about me, it's about old people a long time ago, uh, much wiser, and it's about Charello grape, and it's about limestone, fossilized limestone, because if you study geology, you learn that 18 million years ago, we are covered by the ocean for 3 million years. And this combination of this grape with so reductive, such an amazing aging capability, so austere, giving the protagonism to the, to the roots of the plant that live in this fossilized limestone, make the most mineral sparkling wines ever, together with the fact that we are in Mediterranean. And this is, if you will, will want to use a little bit of a war, crazy word, it's like a miracle, meaning to have Mediterranean climate, such drought, like we're having 22, 23 vintages, Charello grape, harvesting at 11.5 bome to make sparkling wine. You don't want too much alcohol. Neither it would arrive to more than 12.5, 13, because the grape doesn't like to ripen too much. But 11.5 bome at a pH below three, this is Burgundy parameters. Cold Burgundy, not warm Burgundy. So this is what I call like the magic of Penelix, you know, like the, the, the potential. It's not the idea, it is what it is. Eh? And the, the thing is, again, is like that we took the wrong path, you know, the path of volume, the path of like uh, not paying attention to viticulture, not not understanding terroir, and then um, we kind of like destroy, destroy a lot of uh, vineyards and destroy much more, even more difficult to change the reputation of Penetes. But if we hadn't done this, probably now our wines would be more prestigious than Burgundy. Maybe not so expensive because they were not so good at marketing in Spain, but the level of quality of Charello is like for me above Chardonnay. Do you feel like a lot of the other winemakers in the region recognize that as strongly as you and they're coming together now to try and change that? Absolutely. Most, I would say, still winemakers for now that are doing amazing job, much better than myself with Charello, such as Enrique Sule, a more Burgundy approach, Tony Carbon, a more natural approach, uh, Juan Rubio, the, um, Tony with uh, Ramon in Mascandi. Uh, I mean, I don't want to... Uh, my friends from Pardas here. I mean, there's like, like so many people are doing an amazing job. I would say more with the steel. With the sparkling, is still a little tight and a little, you know, like this egoic family marketing kind of thing. But it's changing. Definitely classic Corpinat are movements that I think are interesting and um, and, and trying to change the rules of, of the place. So, um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely. We're not alone on that. That's awesome. So talk to me a bit about the portfolio you have at Reventos E Blanc. So um, obviously you're not making single varietal Sorello, right? So talk to me a little bit about the the wines and your kind of um, philosophy in making these. 
well, they, we're going to go very simple on this because you can look better on, on, in, in the website if you like or the internet. But we run three projects. We run the mother project, it's Raventos y Blanc, in northern Penedes, here where we are. <clears throat> Excuse me, Valley of the River Anoya, Conca del Rio Anoya in Catalan. Then we make still wines in Cansumoy properties, a property that we that found us in 2016, abandoned uh, and, and raving for somebody to re recuperate those old vines of Montone and Sumoy, 600 meters altitude level. And um, this is the project that now is driving me more crazy and uh, putting more energy. Can Sumoy, very special. This is the home of Sumoy, working to make world-class Sumoy. Like I tell you about the potential of Charello, I see a future of Penedes, the valleys, the villages, the vineyards, Charello and Sumoy, like very Burgundy, very, very simplified. So really pay attention to these vineyards, these orientations, the soil profile, etc. cetera. No? Simplify the varietal uh, um, 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 dialogue that I think is a little bit, you know, people when they don't know about wine, talk about labels, and then when they know a little bit, but still don't know, talk about grape varieties, you know, I think we need to really go much, much faster than this and be more in the in the soil, in the terroir, in the vintage characteristics, etc. No? And then I have a three a small project, that, which is in the garage of our home that I decided to take the cars away, actually never been a car in there, and make some uh, very minimal uh, quantities of um, pure natural wine, no uh, no intervention whatsoever, chemical, physical whatsoever. And this is where we're learning about the aging capability and potential of Charello since 2014. This is called Viña del Nogue. And then I made a little bit of an ancestral and the Mas del Serral, uh, most special plot that is also vinified at home. Amazing. So you have a great diversity of wines that you're making and, and different products. I'll definitely include the links to all of that in the show notes for today's episode. So guests can check it out. Um, do you feel thank, like thank, there's... Thank you, Sarah, but, but thank you. But I need to, we need to make an effort to do less diversity eh? and do <laughs> Charello and Sumoy and less wines and give more the... Being the, the less wines you make, the more you are into nature and the more you are into express the place and the more you connect that place with, with the people that love wine. You know, as winemaker, I like to go crazy and now this and this, but I think it's important to really simplify uh, diversity. Also, make me think that a lot, another important thing is to stay true to your place. So really, you know, you go make wines all over the place, you know, and uh, fortunately, some people wanted uh, to make wines together from California to to, I don't know, to Italy, passing from Jerez. And and, and um, for work coincidences, I stay, st stick to Penedes. So it's true we make sparkling and stills, but stick to Penedes, try to simplify, try to be like really close to the place. You know? I, I, I do the walk in the vineyards in here or Kansomoy 3,000 times a year. And, you know, every day I do the walk in the vineyards, I see something different, you know? That's a, just a little example of how important it is to simplify. Yeah, that's awesome. So do you, um, how, how much wine are you producing? How many barrels a year out of the three? We talk in bottles here in, in Europe because we're very old fashioned, sorry. So we make 400,000 bottles of uh, Raventos y Blanc sparkling wine to 500,000, depending on the vintage characteristic. We make um, a couple of hundred thousand bottles of the Kansumoy project. Um, and then in the garage over total, maybe 6,000 bottles. Okay. Okay. Awesome. That's a great production size. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, this is great. I know I have um, actually two of your wines with me. So I have the Reventus y Blanc, um, and then I have a Consumoy as well. So let's take a look at these together, if that's okay. Can you tell us a bit about the sparkling first? So obviously we know there's some uh, Sorello in it, but tell us what else goes in making this wine. Well, you have the texturas da Pedra. What vintage do you have with you, Sarah? This is the 2018. Okay, so you have um, you have kind of a cold expression of texturas da pedra, a cold uh, coldish vintage in, in our um, uh, warm Mediterranean climates. A little, I would say, a little similar to uh, 13, not as rainy as 2020. Um, you will find um, delicacy tension for a wine that is already five years old. Um, this wine stays four years on the lease. And what's important is to understand the vineyard it comes from. It comes from the highest vineyard in the Raventos farm, La Viña Mesalta. It's uh, where the poorest soils are. That's why it's called Texturas da Pedra, means stone textures. And it's really a wine that will speak to you about these stones. If we um, allow ourselves to go to the basics, um, variety, variety uh, dialogue, it's a blend of Charello, 
Charello Barmel, which is red, red Charello, and Sumoll. So you will see has its copperish color because it's a blanc de noirs. Eh? It's more of the 50% of the juice comes from red grapes um, in, of, um, planted in this vineyard. Amazing. And so um, obviously it's not the typical three grapes that would be in cava, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the sumoy, I'm not familiar with that grape. Is that, that something that's unique to the Penedes region? Yeah, that's unique to the Penedes region. It's red. It was abandoned because it's very hard to cultivate. It has high tannins, um, kind of like Cabernet Franc. But when it ripens, it either goes to botrytis very, very easily. It's sensitive to botrytis if it's uh, um, and cultivated in a cold area, or it goes to pacification if it's a warm one. So you have a window of picking of like like hours. Eh? And um, so so people like decided to to go to the easy cava grapes, especially to the Macabeo and the Parellada, which are basically much more easy to grow. No? Um, I think the best for this wine that you're tasting using Sumoy is the acid. It, like Charello, it ripens at low alcohol with high acid. And this helps the wine to age so well and have these freshness sensations. But in the Can Sumoy project, I am working to make 100% red Sumoy. And um, I think one day um, the world will be very happy to taste high, high end of people that love wine, red Sumoy. It's somewhere between a Nebbiolo and a Pinot Noir. Amazing. That sounds delicious. Well, this is incredible. I mean, I agree. Very refreshing, crisp and acidic. The fruit characteristics are so bright. I mean, it's absolutely delicious. This is, I mean, very, very great um, quality, well-balanced, delicious wine. So it's amazing. Cheers. Incredible. Thank you, Sana. It's important that you feel this idea of low tide, um, of uh, iodine, of salinity in the back palate that kind of brings us a lot to the place where it comes from, that uh, that mineralized, that uh, uh, fossilized limestone underneath uh, these, these vineyards. And I think it's a characteristic from the sparkling wines that we can make if we do like low yields, right farming in Northern Penedes. It has some nice like kind of toasted brioche notes too. You get some really beautiful um, developed characteristic after the fruit as well. It's it's delicious. And it's from Vigna Mesa Alta. So is this a single vineyard wine as well? Exactly. Amazing. The highest vineyard in the property. Mesa Alta in Catalan stands for uh, high, highest uh, vineyard. Okay. Amazing. That's delicious. Okay. So tell me about this. Oh, here we go. This um, Can Samoy. Yeah, so so I was telling you, as uh, we're learning to make a 100% sumoil um, at the highest possible quality, um, because we're not very talented, we're blending with garnacha. Garnacha is a more easy grape to vinify, more on the fragrance, the delicacy, the fruit. And um, it helps us make our sumoil understandable, to, to, to polish that sumoil by blending. In the meantime, we dedicate our efforts with these special vineyards of Sumoy that we are finding, recuperating, regrafting, um, uh, renting, and uh, aging the Sumoy in ch local chestnut, in, in bottle, etc. as a hundred percent. No, So this wine that you have in the glass, um, what vintage is it? This is 2021. The 2021, so that's the current vintage, um, uh, is a blend of this grape. I really have uh, so much passion for the Sumoy with the Garnacha. It, you should taste the fruitness of the Garnacha, but this idea of race and rusticity of, of the Sumoy, that's this nebbiolish capability uh, when I, I mentioned before about the grape. 2021, rather warm vintage, well-balanced. Um, the wine has been uh, aging um, mainly um, on its lease uh, in the tanks where it fermented, be it concrete, be, there, be, be it inox. And there is um, less than a quarter of wood aging uh, of the barrel selection that, uh, that we make in the, here in the winery. So would you say that Sumoy typically tends to have a like, higher tannin concentration in the grape skins? Yeah. Exactly. High tannin, uh, extremely high tannin. Um, also, um, high acid and also a certain earthiness, rusticity, um, animalesque notes 
um, um, that really don't come definitely neither from wood doesn't need much neither from from wood or or or, or any uh, um, yeast uh, um, um, uh, not contamination but you know it's it's really a very wild rustic dark grape and that's why i think it's taking long to to understand how we can make it very elegant but the potential is huge are there a lot of other uh, producers in your region that are growing Samoy? Or do you feel like you're one of the... Everybody that is on, in love with wine is trying to work with Samoy in the region. There are some uh, people that uh, started before. Uh, on the natural uh, side, uh, Gloria at El Jellipins is very interesting, her work. On the more modern um, French wood um, is uh, uh, my friend Pep Keralt in, in the Eretat Mont Ruby project. Um, Pardas, also north, up northern in the Anoya Valley. They have been working with Somoy for a long time now. Mascandi also. Uh, and uh, Can Raffles have a beautiful delegate Somoy version. So yeah, definitely. I can definitely understand the comparison with Nebbiolo because you get this kind of cooler climate Mediterranean characteristic, but you still have that bold structure. I mean, it it has a really unique characteristic to it, but you still get great fruit on the nose. Um, I think the garnacha in this case helps to kind of maybe balance out some of that tannin because it's still really fruity and smooth on the finish, but really delicious. And honestly, very different than anything I've tasted before, but I think you're right. The closest would be- You, taste, you, ta you taste more red wines than sparkling wines, right, Sarah? I do. I could tell by you tasting notes here eh? today. I am I'm, I am learning more from your tasting of the Sumoy Garnacha than from your tasting on the on the sparkling wine. I will have, will have, you'll have to come to visit us in Penedes to do the sparkling wine together, and then we go to Nebbiolo and you you teach me to taste the Nebbiolo from the PMO. Perfect. I would love. But that. I agree that 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 Sumoy has a much of a Nebbiolo kind of taste. And also something I forgot to say, it's a low co colored grape. So um, makes it like kind of like a very elegant, uh, very elegant uh, uh, red, red wine. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would surprise folks because you're right in the glass, it's a little bit lighter in color, especially yeah. around the rim, but the, yeah. the body, once you actually taste it, it's really incredible and it definitely lingers. I love the acid. I feel like this would be delicious with a lot of different dishes, any Mediterranean tomato dishes, pasta, even different types of pork or beef. This is, I mean, really tasty. This is the Nebbiolo thing that we all love, no? that is so delicate when you look at it and you kind of like has like this, this um, you know, like very soft uh, appearance, but then it's so tasty and it has so much body. And this kind of like a strange combination, I think, makes the wine very special. I agree. I'll be excited to uh, come out and visit and try some Sumoy by itself to understand the grape a little bit more and understand what the potential is there. Pepe, this is awesome. Very cool. Amazing wines and really incredible story uh, from your, your family's winery. Is there anything exciting happening in this new year that you're looking forward to in 2024? Don't forget to, to, to talk about Charello a lot, eh? and, and because I think Sumoy is very interesting, also it's something very new, etc. But Charello deserves the attention of all you wine people, important people that uh, communicate and, and spread the word, because it's like really, really an incredible white grape. Um, you know, uh, we just need some rain. That's, uh, that's all we need. Uh, the rest is, uh, is cool. Good. Has it been kind of dry there? Very dry 2022 and extremely dry 2023. So unless we have some rain for 2024, I may be coming to work for Disneyland in Orlando. <laughs> okay, well, let's pray for rain, definitely. How's wine tourism in your area? Can folks come visit you? Can they come to the winery and taste your wines in person? I think wine tourism is a disaster. We shouldn't uh, talk about wine tourism whatsoever. We have to be very careful in Lapa because it's becoming a zoo. So um, really, you know, um, I am very against enotourism concept and all this. Uh, it's pretty much against the authenticity. Eh? Of course, we receive people with appointment and we like to share what we do in measure. But wine, tour wine tourism kind of like kills the authenticity of the region and also the, the, the nature. It's very, it's very interference with the nature, you know. Um, we humans are a, we are a very a, a very uh, strange um, 
species in in uh, in the planet and we, and until we learn how to behave better in the nature it's better that we don't go so much to the to the nature places you know that's a really good point and actually believe it or not pepe you're the first winemaker that has ever said that on the show and i've interviewed a lot of winemakers in the last 3 years and I appreciate that perspective because I think you're right. I think far too often we probably um, over uh, populate a region and the tourists come in and destroy it with hotels and cool new restaurants and things. And then it's not authentic to the region anymore. So I appreciate your perspective. Well, so, so, so sorry to be uh, that sincere. I think we have a challenge, at least in Catalonia, that people don't want to work in a in the rural areas so we need people to come live and create communities and work in the areas but not tourists do you have um, restrictions in your area about the requirement of hand harvesting versus machine harvesting or is it totally fine to do sadly harvesting? the cava disaster have made that most people are planting uh, for machine harvest and they are machine harvesting um um we never done this and I will never I prefer to go to come work in Disneyland than, than do machine harvesting. I think it's a disaster for the plant, for grape selection, for uh, respect, uh, for, for, for pollution, for, for everything. But sadly, a, a big part of Penedès is, 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 is machine harvesting for cava, yes. Okay, interesting. That's awesome. Well, Pepe, thank you so much for the insight into your region and your winery and your wines today. This was an awesome conversation. So thanks for coming on the Wine CEO podcast. Thank you for choosing us among so many more interesting wineries. Uh, the territory uh, appreciates uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Sarah. All right, friends, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Pepe Reventos. I had such a fun time chatting with him. He is an awesome advocate for the integrity of his region, looking at the grape varieties being grown there, the wines being produced there, and he gave so much insight into the unique challenges around the Cava Dio, around the Panetes region, and some awesome things to look forward to in the incredible wines that are being made here. I really appreciated his conversation around wine tourism. I think it's one that I don't think about as often as I should, and I probably don't mention it here on the show, but we really do have to be careful. While wine tourism is an amazing opportunity to drive revenue for a region and help businesses grow and support their families, we also have to balance that with making sure that wine tourism doesn't destroy the authenticity and integrity of a region as well as the natural environment too, right? So definitely a great point and something to think about further. I hope that from this episode, you were inspired to try some sparkling wine from the Panetes region in Spain. Between last week's episode as well as this episode, hopefully it gave you some insight into the amazing sparkling wines that are being made in the Panetes region. If you have any questions about this episode or wine in general, don't hesitate to send me an email, sarah at thewineceo.com, or you can go ahead and send me a DM on Instagram at thewineceo. Until next week, friends, I hope you drink something new and delicious, and I will catch you all in the next episode of the Wine CEO Podcast. 